you're tuned in to CorbettReport.com, celebrating a decade of alternative media dominance. Happy birthday, Corbett Report. Welcome, my friends. Welcome to another edition of the Corbett Report. I'm your host, as always, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you from the sunny climes of Western Japan, here on the first day of June 2017. And you are tuned into episode 318 of the Corbett Report podcast, celebrating the Corbett Report's decade of alternative media dominance. Because, yes, that is correct. Today, June 1st, 2017, marks the 10 year mark since the beginning of of the website and this podcast with the launch of episode one on Investigate 9-11 on June 1st, 2007. And it's a story that you've probably heard by now if you listen to this podcast, but the long story short is that it was 2006 that a rather mundane event occurred in my life. I moved into a new apartment building here in Japan. There I was living the humble life of an English instructor here in Japan and moved into a new apartment that came with an internet connection. And it was the first time I'd had an internet connection in my home in a number of years. So I did what you did when you had a new internet connection in your home back in 2006. I started watching Google video and YouTube documentaries and following links to various websites and browsing archive.org and other places. And long story short, I fell down the rabbit hole investigating 9-11 and the monetary paradigm and things of that nature. And so, it wasn't long before I decided the need to, uh, to share this information with others. <laughs> and that need manifested itself in this podcast and website that you are consuming right now. An incredible story from my vantage point, because it really does show that from very small acorns, mighty oaks do grow. And just to give you a sense of that, the first ever episode of the podcast, I simply mailed uh, the link out to about 40 contacts in my contact list, friends and family and ex-coworkers and other people. And I think I had about 20 downloads that first, uh, that first week. And (laughs) they weren't all regular listeners, let's put it that way. They were people who, I think, gave a sympathy click. And here we are now, uh, with my voice reaching tens of thousands of people on a regular basis, millions of people in the aggregate. It is incredible, unthinkable. And for the benefit of those following along at home in the video, this is that apartment building. This is the building from which the Corbett Report was born. And in fact, uh, I'm pointing right now to the apartment where it all started. That is the place that 10 years ago I launched this podcast. It is incredible for me to think about the, that 10 year journey that I've been on and uh, where this has ultimately ended up or so far ended up. It really is incredible. Now, as I say, you've probably heard that story about that apartment building. Uh, if you've watched this podcast for any length of time. But you may not have heard the story about how the seeds for what I think became the Corbett Report were planted a couple of years earlier by some overzealous uh, customs officials in Vancouver. That's an interesting story that I did relate to my subscribers back in a subscriber-only video that I did back in, uh, oh, it must have been five years ago, maybe five and a half years ago now. As I've mentioned in a couple of interviews now, maybe you've heard me talk about this, maybe you haven't, but there's another aspect to my waking up story, and uh, that's one of the stories that I guess everyone likes to hear from from people when they uh, when they start to encounter them as a source of information. It's uh, how did you get involved in this? How did you wake up? And uh, and of course, that's uh, that's not implying that I'm fully awoken and, and or anything like that. I think we're all in the process of waking up to various layers of the. Uh, the onion, or whatever analogy you want to use, but uh, but for myself, I, I as everyone's heard, I've I have the story about moving into the new apartment and uh, encountering YouTube-related videos and things about uh, flying orbs on 9/11, and eventually running across some inf- interesting information that really did bring up things about 9/11, and I started getting into that, and from that, I found central banking fraud and. Etc. Etc. I think I've told that story quite a few times now, but um, one story that I've mentioned a couple of times now 
that predates that and predates what I think of when I think of the Corbett Report was something that happened to me in the beginning part of 2006. The latter half, specifically around September when I moved into the new apartment, was when I really started doing the research that it became the Corbett Report, which then was launched in June 2007. But, uh, but at the beginning of 2006, I was here in Japan and I had to go back to Canada for my friend's wedding. I was the best man, so I had to go. And uh, so I went for just a one week trip. It's, uh, it's not something I would advise people to do because I was uh, severely jet lagged for that week, we'll say, and uh, basically part of the living dead. But, uh, but of course it was great to see my, my friend's wedding and to be part of that. So I was going back for a week. And as I was coming from Japan into Vancouver to then go back to Calgary to, to go to my friend's wedding, I had to clear Canadian customs, so I was going through and being slightly, you know, uh, jet lagged or whatever it is after sitting on a plane for eight or nine hours or however long it is, and then getting back to my home and native land in Canada and, and being able to speak English again to people randomly. That's, I mean, that's something you take for granted probably uh, wherever you might be, but, uh, but I certainly can't because I'm here in Japan. have to muddle through with my not-so-great Japanese. But uh, So I was whatever, feeling uh, happy or whatever to be back home, and so I, uh, I made the mistake of joking around with the, the customs guy, and I, uh, he asked me what I was doing, and I said I was back to attend my friend's wedding and to, uh, to watch the Calgary Flames win the Stanley Cup. Ha ha ha. Because uh, he was in, Van we were in Vancouver, Vancouver Canucks, Calgary Flames. If you're Canadian, you don't get it. But anyway, it's just a sports thing. And uh, he just sort of nods and makes a little scribble on my uh, customs declaration form that uh, that I guess meant something like this guy is flagged, and uh, gives it to me. So I go to get my bags, and as I'm waiting there, this uh, security woman comes up to me and says, uh, uh, I, "When you get your bag, you got to come with me. We're gonna check you out or whatever." So I thought, "Oh, great." And at the time, I, was, I had a bit of a beard, so um, and I was a single man traveling alone with a beard. I mean, clearly, he must be a terrorist. So, um, so I thought, well, okay, this is going to be interesting. So I get my bag, and we go into the their little back room where they have uh, people. I mean, they have the space for you to open up your bag, and they go through everything, and you put all of your underwear and everything out on the table for them to look through. Literally, looking through your underwear, lovely. And, uh, and so this woman was uh, going through my stuff, and it was, it was bizarre. It was a bizarre, bizarre, bizarre experience, and not really what I was expecting. I was expecting them to go through all my stuff and find I didn't have any drugs or guns or anything. So, you know, okay, you can go. But, uh, but it was much, much stranger than that. It was them, it was this woman not only taking my stuff out, but going through each item to a bizarre extent where, for example, I was uh, on the plane, I was reading a... A Chuck Palahniuk novel. He wrote uh, Fight Club. He wrote some other books. I can't remember which one it was. Uh, not a particularly interesting one. And she takes a look at the book and the cover and, and looks at me and like, oh, do, do you enjoy this book? And she said it in kind of a meaningful way, like this answer is going to say something about me. And I'm just sitting there thinking, what? I don't... And so I just tried to answer as honestly as possible. Well, um, you know, it was an interesting, or I thought it's kind of interesting, but it's not really my thing, or something like that. And then she goes into my uh, my phone, which I had on me. Uh, it was a Japanese phone, and at the time it, it had, you know, nice color photographs, which was kind of, you know, I don't know, we're talking six or seven years ago. It was still pretty interesting back then. But she was wondering why I didn't have so many photos on my phone. It was just a few, and I'm like, well, it's a new phone. And, and so there was all that rigmarole, and she was like, oh, who's this? Who's this? Looking at the photos on my phone. Well, it's my friend. I just took a picture of my friend. What is this? Like, what, what am I supposed to say? <laughs> but anyway, I knew it was all part of the game, so I'm just playing along with it. Yes, yes, answering the questions. And then... They find my diary in my uh, in my bags, and she takes it out and she starts leafing through my diary and uh, reading bits and pieces of it, as they do, I guess. And at the time, I remember thinking, "This is so bizarre. Like, I don't know what my rights are. Do I have the right to say to this customs official, no, you can't say that. You can't. You can't read this. You can't look at that. Or this is my private stuff. Why are you reading it?" But then I'd look like a terrorist, and of course I was still in the pre-Corbett Report mindset, so I didn't really know what to do in that situation. I didn't know that it was going to be a problem or, or anything of that sort. So I'm just thinking, well, this is really bizarre, until she says, hmm, I'd like to take a photocopy of this. Is that all right? 
And again, I'm thinking, well, what does that mean? You're going to go and take a photocopy of this? So I'm assuming somewhere in the, uh, in the records of that, uh, that visit, I guess the Canadian government has on file a photocopy of some of my diary. So I figured if the Canadian government has some of this, why don't I share it with you? And I thought it was particularly funny, not in a ha-ha way, obviously, but particularly funny that one of the entries in my diary specifically, I thought, might have caught their eye if they were looking hard enough. So I'll read it for you because it's, uh, <clears throat> well, it was something that I wrote at the time. It's more metaphorical or, or sort of a grand abstraction because I have, I had and have harbored in the past some grand ideas that I'd become sort of a literary sensation. I always wanted to be a writer. So, you know, the type of pretentious literary the di diary that I kept uh, for many years and still occasionally write in. But anyway, um, this one was from, uh, I guess this is the 12th of June or no, that would be December 6th, 2005. And I wrote this as on a whim as something that occurred to me that particular day. Never trust anyone who dreams of a glorious death, a sacrificial death, a death that will somehow justify a life. Or to put it another way, never trust anyone. Starry-eyed dreamers, all of us, facing the firing squad of a tyrant without a blindfold, staring them in the eyes and telling them to aim for the heart so that future generations will be able to decode the true meaning of this moment. Or to rush into the burning building at the cry of an infant never to return. Or to stare down a mugger with a knife, look him right in the eye and tell him you're not afraid to die. Cancers born from guilt, accidents of bad conscience, the most selfless of sacrifices, the needless taking of lives, all ways of finding me all ways of finding meaning in that which is nothing but the end of meaning. The fetishization is the danger. We are all suicide bombers. Dun, dun, dun. So you can see how a customs official at an airport might find that to be an interesting statement that they'd want to take a photocopy of because I must clearly be a terrorist. So as I say, I'm sure the Canadian government has some file on me somewhere. Um, Probably for the corporate report, if for nothing else, but um, that must be part of it. So um, obviously I meant it in more of a literary sense in that we have all had those daydreams of having some glorious death on some battlefield that will change, you know, human events and, and make everything a glorious utopia. And if you know my work, which I guess you probably do since you're subscribed, you know that that's not really what I really believe, but I, I know we've all had those types of thoughts, uh, stray thoughts that have popped into our head. That was my way of kind of making it a literary thing. But there you go. So that was one of the pages that uh, they could have photocopied. I don't know. She took it into some other room and did whatever she did with it. But uh, but I thought that was interesting. So when I got back to Japan, I, uh, I wrote about it in my diary. So I'll share a little bit of that for you, with you. Uh, April 24th, 2006. I finally figured out why I write this journal in the second person. It's neither out of self-referential solipsism or egotistical legacy making. It's actually for the customs officers. The ones who stop me because I said I'm a Flames fan and search my bag, flip through Invisible Monsters by Chuck Palahniuk, and ask me with an arched eyebrow whether I like it. The ones who take my diary and driver's license off into their office for 20 minutes. To them, I can only say, here I am, my privatest privacies ripped open for your prying eyes. So what do you see? Anyway, just uh, some literary pretensions from my diary that uh, apparently was interesting enough that the Canadian government wanted their hands on it. But as I've said in a couple of interviews now, that was one of the incidents that really, in some ways, prepared the, the soil for the planting of the seeds that became the Corbett Report. Because I think with a lot of us, until this police state really reaches its dirty fingers into our lives in some meaningful way we don't really understand and we'll never really understand it. Unfortunately, as human beings, we tend to need that, that personal uh, touch to, to, to make us understand what it is we're facing. And I didn't think about it when I was starting the website, but I think this is actually one of the formative experiences that let me know what was really going on and, uh, and know that there's something really, 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 really wrong with a bunch of people in uniforms and badges who b claim to be able to, to flip through your personal diary and photocopy it and do whatever they want. I mean, that's a very specific point at which you realize this is a police state and that's not cool. Anyway, 
that's just one of the things that set me along my path. So in the comments of this video, why don't we talk about things that set you on your path? What is it that made you realize what's really going on or really brought it home to you? And is there something in your past that might have planted or, or fertilized the soil that became the planted uh, seeds that became the, the sprouting of the information? Because as I say, it might be something that was formative way back in the past. We are all suicide bombers. Ooh. Yes, interesting indeed the way that, uh, as I say, the soil can be fertilized and then the seeds later planted. And that was just one of the earlier aspects of my coming to, I think, start the corporate report before I even thought about starting the corporate report, if you know what I mean. At any rate, uh, again, that was something that I shared back with the subscribers in a subscriber only video something like five years ago now. So uh, it is interesting to look back at the formative experiences in one's life and what really sets you on the path to where you end up. And it is also interesting to take a look at some of those things from the former life. So I just showed you the apartment where it all started. And I have in my hands right here another extra little treat for the people watching the video at home. The laptop from which it all started. It's ridiculously clunky and heavy to me at this point. I, and it's the screen is just such an odd, odd shape and size. It's so four by three. It's, it's really odd. It just seems odd in every way. And it's, it's only about 14 years old now. I bought this laptop uh, in 2003. And so by the time that I came to start the website in 2007, it was already getting a bit old and a bit beat up, and it wasn't quite working that well, but it worked well enough to put the podcast together and the uh, minimal video editing and stuff that I did for the first year or two of the website. Uh, it, it, it it held up remarkably well, considering considering it was already old at the time, and considering all I had was this cheap little $20 mic that I literally just went out and bought uh, on, from the local electronics store. I mean, just, just everything was kind of seat of the pants and not very not very methodically thought through but in retrospect I'm glad I did it that way because if I had stopped and planned out everything and made sure everything was perfect before I proceeded I never would have done all of this the things like the corporate report don't happen if you obsess about every little detail and everything has to be perfect before you can start no you just got to start and do it 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 until you get better and uh <laughs> I'm sorry for the, uh, you know, audio quality or lack thereof in the early podcasts, but hey, it is what it is, and it's a guy learning how to do it as he's going. Uh, that's literally what this is about. So this is the, pod the laptop that I started the website on and ran it for, I think, two years. It was 2009 before I got my first desktop, really, and uh, wow. And and so it did pretty well. It it almost can boot up now. I mean, it boots up and you can get at least the desktop. And this was the desktop that I was using uh, back in the early days of the corporate report. And for the benefit of those just listening to the audio of this rather than watching the video, it's just a, a picture. It was a, apparently, I guess this was like a bus, uh, you know, billboard but a bus stop billboard somewhere or some some kind of bus shelter advertisement that somebody you know put up obviously and it says on september 11th ask yourself when history repeats do we notice and it's hitler's reichstag and bush's 9 11 and that that and then that orange background that or, that shade of orange when i see that that reminds me of the summer of 2007 sitting there in the sweltering summer heat on my floor, of course, it's Japan, I'm sitting on the floor with this laptop, you know, writing an article or starting, you know, doing a video or, or whatever. That was where it started, and I have such vivid memories of, of that first summer, and kind of the excitement of starting something new. And I knew what I was doing, in the sense that I knew that this was something. I knew that I really, this was something that I cared about, that I was really going to put myself into. And I remember all my friends thinking, what are you doing? You're crazy. Why are you doing this? They thought it was just some fad or something that I was doing. No, this is, this is really something that I'm going to put myself into. And I remember, I remember every day to get pumped up to do something, to you know, write an article or to do a podcast or whatever it was I was doing that day, I would listen to um, 
What Would You Do by Paris? I was listening to that song, and that would instantly get me motivated, and I'd, I'd, start, <laughs> I'd start working. It's just, yeah, I have vivid memories of that time. Very, very interesting to look back on it now. That was where it all started. So, anyway, I, uh, these memories are not quite so poignant for you as they are for me, but uh, it's still, it's fun just to, even just to see the technology itself, and this cl hefty, clunky, beat-up old laptop that the Corporate Report started from, which, again, let this be a lesson to anyone out there that you really can do it with whatever you have, whatever crap equipment you have that isn't good enough. If you care about it, and if you do it over and over and over, it will become something. And it's the process of becoming that is, that is why we're here on this planet, if we want to get really big and think about the big issues. But anyway, um, but of course I'm not here by myself doing this. Well, I am, you know, technically, literally, I'm in an empty room talking to myself at the moment, as I, <laughs> as I guess I often do. But there are people out there that are receiving this in one way or another. So I did ask for your 10th anniversary messages, and I received, I received a lot of different messages, some very interesting and creative ones, including a, some sort of reimagining of a Corbett Report theme, or theme song, by a, an Australian rock band that has asked to remain anonymous. And I know what you're thinking. It is not Brock West. It has nothing to do with Brock. He is not the uh, anonymous Australian rock band. It's, it is an Australian rock band, that's all I'm permitted to say, that has made this reimagining of the Corporate Report theme that I will be playing for you at the end of this episode. So please do stick around for that. It's just incredible, and uh, I'm always excited for that sort of stuff, so if, if there are any other <laughs> rock stars or anyone else listening with that, that kind of ability, please do send stuff in. I will absolutely use it on the podcast. I do appreciate that. Um, and on top of that, all sorts of happy 10th anniversary messages. So let's just hear some of the feedback that I got uh, over the past few weeks. Around 2012, I became interested in how the money system works. Things like fractional reserve banking, uh, the petrodollar. You know, there were many people talking about these things at the time, but the thing that set James apart was how much detail he went into and how he always provided the sources to everything he spoke about and never tried to exaggerate. Um, and that's still true up to this day. So, James, congratulations on 10 years and Here's for another 10. Thanks, mate. James, William Spencer in Kentucky, U.S. Uh, I got turned on to your work after the 2016 election when I was distraught. I was an 82-year-old follower of um, G. Edward Griffin, who turned me on to you. Uh, How Big Oil Conquered the World was very shocking. There's a lot of other very shocking things, um, and I've gotten a new paradigm as a result of following your work and other things you've turned me on to, like NewsBud and Global Research. Uh, James, I want to um, say that this, How Big Oil Conquered the World was one of the big shockers, and your interviews with Connie Fogel of Canada um, really helped me. Um, you know, she acknowledges the emotional thing people go through when they have a paradigm change and they go through the veil and see what's really going on. So that's really good. And I also appreciate you've incorporated and respected a lot of people who you might not share all of your views with. And I think that's really important for us to do in this world. Uh, one of the key ones is Alex Jones. I don't agree with all of his stuff, but he's had some amazing whistleblower um, uh, type interviews um, and his work's got to be respected. So James, thank you very much for your work. I have, I am a subscriber, and I also have um, purchased some of your material. So thank you again. Hi, James. Uh, my online moniker is I is bloke, and I'm speaking to you from the surprisingly uh, dry and sunny climes of southernmost Ireland. Um, so congratulations on your um, 10th anniversary. It's quite a remarkable achievement. And I know that I won't be the first to express the hope that we will be blessed with your broadcast for many, many years to come. I stumbled on the rabbit hole in late 2012 and came across you fairly soon after. I remember being particularly struck by your piece uh, after the Boston bomb 
um, and your observation that the war on terror had already been lost. So, yeah, pretty soon after that, I found myself working through your extensive and impressive archive. The uh, thing I love most about the court report is that even though many of the subjects you cover can be pretty depressing, you inject a lot of humour and hope into your broadcasts and you equip people with the information to make their own minds up and also make their own contributions to building a world worth living in. So with that in mind, I think the piece you made after the birth of your daughter has to get an honourable mention in your hidden gem countdown, but the bot. But the podcast I especially want to nominate is episode 277, But What About the Roads, which literally blew my mind in a good way. So congratulations and keep going. Hi, James. This is Demers from Brazil. Uh, the first time I came across your channel, I was looking for information or analysis on Stanley Kubrick and his films because I am a big fan of Stanley Kubrick and I keep watching his videos, his films on and on and on. So I was, I am always very interested in his work and analysis of his work. So uh, when I was searching for and watching videos about Stanley Kubrick, I came across your video, your video entitled The Kubrick Question. I watched it Truly, and I really enjoyed it. And one thing led to another. I began watching all your other videos, your analysis to news, special reports, documentaries, and also the New World Next Week videos. And now I am one of, uh, you are one of my main sources for alternative media analysis of current events. So I would like to congratulate you for your. 10 year anniversary and I wish really wish really hope you keep up the good work okay all the best man bye hey James congratulations on 10 years I just wanted to say how much I appreciated your efforts in focusing on how important it is to have evidence I think in today's modern media It's easy to say, experts say, scientists say, intelligence officials say, and people will just buy it. With your show, it's always been about, here are the sources, here's how I've come to this conclusion, and here's why I believe what I believe. It makes it a little easier to show that maybe I'm not the crazy person Maybe the person who bought into these false ideas spread by the media uh, is, is, is fallible, is maybe just, you know, I don't want to blame them for it. And this is the hard situation about the whole thing. And I also like that you've contributed the term to the lexicon. And I don't know if it was you, but forensic journalism or open source journalism because I do take your work seriously and the work of you and others, I think is helping to change a lot of people's minds, mine included and congratulations on 10 years. Hey James, happy birthday, man. What an excellent show. What an excellent person. What an excellent example of what individuals can do. I'm so happy with your work, man. Keep it up. Hopefully there's many more birthdays to go. Hidden gems are replete through the years there. Like you said, it would be really hard to pick, man. The technocracy videos are really, really good. Um, my cake, the cake has to go to Hunting the Octopus, parts one and two, man. What happened to Indira Singh? Uh, if anybody knows, they should contact you or have her contact the world so we know she's okay. Uh, the human race is good. We, we do care about her. We want to know what's going on. Um, don't ever stop what you're doing, man. Keep it up. Be good. Dear Mr. Corbett, well done. Ten years. Thank you very much for your library of articles, references, interviews, and documentaries on how the world actually works. Best of luck to you in the future. No, thank you. 
Hugo, I really appreciate your message. You have a nice voice. You should do podcasting too. <laughs> no, just just kidding around. All seriously, all kidding aside, truly, honestly, thank you to each and every one of you for your messages. Uh, various people sending in messages from all sorts of different uh, media, and I truly do appreciate it. It really did make a difference, and it's fascinating for me to find the different ways that people first discovered my work. But this, of course, ends up very quickly becoming just a praise to myself and uh, everyone bow down to James Corbett, which, of course, is not the point of this. Uh, well, I mean, what is the point? One point is that what I've done and what I've constructed is built, of course, on the back of hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of researchers that have come before and are still here and doing the yeoman's work of digging up and and getting this information from all sorts of different sources. And I'm just one guy that's collating information here and there and putting it together and hoping that I can put it in a way that'll make sense to people. But uh, obviously the work that I do is just one little part of a much, much grander thing that's happening between all sorts of people all around the world. So thank you to all the researchers who make this work possible. And speaking of making this work possible, when it comes to the website specifically, the website literally would not be here right now if it were not for the people who subscribe to the website. Uh, literally, if I was still an English teacher full-time and had a family that I was dealing with, there's just absolutely no way that I could be doing the website right now. So it is because you guys had the faith in me and the work that I'm doing to entrust me with $1 per month uh, or or more uh, in, in order to continue doing this work. It is because of that that this website is here. So please do give yourself a big pat on the back. And on the related note, if you've been listening over the past 10 years and you haven't yet contributed the $1 a month, I, I would truly appreciate it. Um, but obviously, again, I couldn't do this work without you guys, and I couldn't do this without the people who've helped me out along the way. Um, too many to mention, and I don't want to start mentioning names, because when I start mentioning names, then other people will go, well, what about me? And, oh, of course, you too, yes. Uh, I feel like an Oscar speech or something, but I, I really do have to thank, specifically, uh, the person who really did make me make that switch from... English teaching into podcasting full-time. The person who prompted me across that doorway was Professor Michelle Chosodovsky of globalresearch.ca. Uh, I first met him in 2009, I want to say, when I was on a trip to Canada. I went to interview him at his home, and uh, it was that a little bit of that interview actually ended up in my Federal Reserve documentary, and we got to talking about making videos and the work that I do. He was quite interested. A couple of years later, 2011, he got, he got in touch with me and said, well, I'm thinking of starting GRTV. Would you like to be the video uh, director for that? And I thought about it for two and a half seconds and thought, yeah, okay. <laughs> and that was really, that was the prompt that got me to uh, get off of English teaching and get into this full time. So without Professor Chosodovsky, this website might not exist in the form that it does now. And uh, also, of course, to Sibel Edmonds, who I, back in 2006, when I was first, first learning about all of this, I was watching documentaries like Kill the Messenger and, and thinking about what an incredibly brave person person Sibel Edmonds is and how much her story is meant in terms of just everything that's gone on in this war of terror. And I interviewed her, I think, again in 2009, 2010, something like that, and then didn't hear from her for another year, year and a half, something like that, and then got this email out of the blue. I'm, I've got this website, BoilingFrogsPost.com. I've been watching your videos. I think you'd would you like to make a video series for Boiling Frogs Post? Again, I thought for about two and a half seconds and said, where do I sign up? So uh, again, that was an incredible uh, thing for me. And of course, James Evan Pilato, MediaMonarchy.com. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when we first got in touch. 2007, I want to say, maybe latter part of 2007. And then 2008, we interviewed each other a couple of times. We talked about the idea of doing a video series. And then in 2009, we started it up, New World Next Week, almost every single week for the past, what, eight years now? Uh, and as I've said before on air, and I really do mean it, I couldn't think of anyone else that I have ever met 
online or off, that I could have done such a series with. Uh, James M. Pilato shows up every week willing to do the work and put in the hours. And uh, my hat's off to that incredible diligence with which he does that. And the incredible work he does over at Media Monarchy, helping to keep me informed of all the news stories passing through the 24-7 news cycle. And then finally on this list of people that I need to thank, of course, of course, I have to thank video editor Brock West, who really... I mean, again, <laughs> I'm saying this a lot now, but it's true. Without Brock West, the videos that you're seeing and the videos that are coming on three or four times a week basis would not be coming. I would be at best able to do a, you know, a video of me holding an iPhone um, and talking into the camera. Uh, it, with all the other stuff I'm doing, I just don't have time for video editing. So it was years ago when I first had my... Uh, well, maybe he emailed me before that point, but I remember he called in on when I had my Corporate Report radio show. I remember specifically because here I am in Japan doing this radio show in the United States and we have this caller from Australia. <laughs> Welcome to the age of the internet. And uh, so we talked a couple of times and then he was out visiting in, in Japan in the city that I live in because he had had friends that he had met in Australia that lived here. And so he was visiting them. We decided to meet up for lunch, we had a curry, we talked for a couple of hours, that was it. The next year, he did it again, he did another Japanese trip, he came to see me, we spent uh, some more time, and then uh, he came again, and we talked about this idea, well, would you like to get into this? Maybe you could do some video editing, it would really help out, and he started editing New World next week. I taught him everything that I knew on Final Cut Pro in maybe a month or two, and by that point, he... He was already away to the races, and by this point, he is absolutely incredible, doing incredible work, not only at Corbett Report, but also at NewsBud. So he uh, really has absolutely essential to what it is that I do right now. And uh, trust me, uh, it's an incredible amount of work to do video editing. Uh, I know because I did it myself for many years, and it's very tedious. And so hats off to him for putting... The, not just putting random images and video and things on the screen for you to look at while I'm talking, but uh, actually the right thing at the right time to make it visually interesting and to give you information. That is a skill, and Brock West has it in spades. So thank you, Brock, for all the work that you do. Um, just incredible. So, all right, let's keep things moving along here. I want to address, as you heard in at least one or two of those messages earlier, uh, people were talking about the hidden corporate report gems. Uh, as you may or may not know, I put out a video a couple weeks ago asking people for the 10th anniversary, could you nominate your hidden corporate report gem? What, uh, what little gem in the archives that most people probably don't know about do you think is worth uh, listening to? And Tons of responses. So again, thank you to everyone who responded. I, I specifically asked for Corporate Report members to leave their hidden Corporate Report gem in the comment section of uh, the video, uh, the, the hidden Corporate Report gem video, and lots and lots of great, thoughtful responses. Of course, there were a lot of people who were nominating the not-so-hidden gems, uh, I think. The uh, Big Oil documentary, 9-11 Conspiracy Theory, uh, Century of Enslavement, uh, 9 11 trillions, uh, 9 11 uh, suspects. Uh, I'm glad to see there were a few people nominating the Timothy McVeigh um, mini documentary thing. That I put a lot of work into that. I didn't think most people really thought much about it, but I'm glad that it did strike a chord because I think it's a fascinating uh, story. So lots of great uh, responses in terms of the not so hidden gems. Also, some great responses of people digging up really hidden gems, really things that most people probably don't know exist in the archives. All, um, right back to the beginning and right forwards to uh, 2016, 2017, all sorts of responses. Um, my interview with Russell Tice and uh, my episode on mind control and just all sorts of stuff. And um, uh, special, special hats off to Voltaic Dude and Philomen, who both had really extensive lists of just interview after podcast after video of all sorts of things from the archives. So thank you very much for doing that. Uh, I, anyone who is interested, who is just getting into the Corbett Report, that might be a good place to direct people to see some of my past work. Uh, I, as I said in my Hidden Corporate Report Gem video, choosing a favorite from myself is impossible because, again, it's like choosing children. So I don't, I can't, I can't possibly say this is the podcast, this is the interview, this is the video. But I do want to bring attention to 
an interview, which I think is a hidden gem, not the hidden gem again, but a hidden gem from the archives um, that I think encapsulates a lot of what I do. Uh, It is interview 876, James Corbett Blows the Lid Off of Benghazi Gate, where I was talking to Ed and Ethan of the Ed and Ethan Show about Benghazi Gate, uh, which was in the news at that time. This was an interview from uh, May 2014. And at that time, the Benghazi Gate thing and the hearings and Hillary Clinton and what did she know and all of that was still swirling around. And there was a lot of that in the news, but it was a lot of the left-right kind of political football issue nonsense distraction from the real story of Benghazi Gate, which, of course, was the story of the gun running that they were doing through Benghazi that the ambassador was a part of. They were running the, the guns out from Libya over to Syria so that they could fund the uh, the terrorists in Syria, uh, which, you know, uh, and then amazingly, ISIS springs up out of nowhere. Who would have foreseen it? Um, so this was... Uh, I mean, this was the real story, and this is what I wanted to articulate. So I went on the Ed and Ethan show. They wanted to have me on to talk about Benghazi because I'd been talking about it on my show recently at that time. And so I gave them this half-hour data dump of information, story after story after story. Here's the sources, mainstream sources as well. Hey, even CNN talked about what were the CIA doing on the ground there, and no one will talk. And, oh, the CIA is giving monthly polygraph tests to every single agent who was there on the ground in Benghazi to make sure that they're not spilling the beans about what they were really doing. And, look, we have this source and this source and this source talking about the gun running and and uh, I laid it out, I, I think, in, in true, you know, good corporate report fashion, just fact after fact after fact after fact. And after this half hour data dump, uh, one of the hosts, I can't remember which one, Ed or Ethan, had expressed beforehand that oh, he's not really into these conspiracy things. And, and afterwards he said, yeah, you know, this conspiracy stuff, I just don't, I don't think that the governments can really pull this stuff off. So anyway, let's talk about blah, blah, blah. And it was, <laughs> it was uh, just... Pretty much an encapsulation of, I'm sure, what we all experience. Give fact, 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 detail, source, fact, fact, link, source. And then, ah, I don't really believe that conspiracy stuff. And then the funniest part is that by the next year, it was mainstream news, what I had been just telling them and laying out for them for half an hour. It was even on the talking head MSM by that point. Well, Jenna, this Defense Intelligence Agency report dated October 5th, 2012, and copied to the State Department, CIA, and senior military leadership, leaves no doubt that U.S. intelligence agencies were aware that lethal weapons were being shipped to Syria via the port of Benghazi. It reads in part, quote, weapons from the former Libya military stockpiles were shipped from the port of Benghazi, Libya, to the port of Benais and the port of Borj, Islam, Syria. The weapons shipped during late August 2012 were sniper rifles, RPGs, and 120 25 millimeter and 155 millimeter howitzers re- missiles. But in a recent interview with Fox's Brett Baer, the former acting CIA director skirted the weapons topic and what the U.S. knew about it. Were CIA officers tracking the movement of weapons from Libya to Syria? Can't talk about that. Can't talk about Can't it. Can't talk about it. So are you saying categorically that the U.S. government and the CIA played no role whatsoever in the movement of weapons from Libya yes, to Syria? Yes, we played no role. Now, whether we were watching other people do it, I can't talk about it. So, what are you going to do? You can lead the horses to water, but you can't make them actually look at the sources, I guess. Anyway, well, there you go. And that's no aspersion against Ed or Ethan in their show. It's just that was a nice encapsulation of what it's like uh, for people doing this type of work. And I'm sure most of the people in the audience has had that experience at some point. So I I think they can probably relate to it. But again, I think it was, it's probably worth re-listening to just to get, you know, up to speed on Benghazi Gate or at least where it stood in 2014. Um, Lots of interesting information in that one. But if I'm going to pick my favorite hidden corporate report gem from the list of hidden corporate report gems that were in that uh, particular thread up on the website, I'm going to have to really give my thanks to NAMCC, user NAMCC, for uh, nominating a video that he didn't remember the name of. He was just describing it. And then Home Remedy Supply, who, again, hats off, does incredible work in the comments section, giving tons and tons of sources and links and interesting information. He came in with the link to this video, which is not that old. So I'm not sure it's 
hidden somewhere in the back archives of the corporate report. But at any rate, it's probably one that a lot of people haven't seen yet. And I think it perfectly really does get to the heart of my main message. If I had to instill what I do and why I do it and why it's why it's important and what I hope to accomplish into six minutes or so, this would be it. It was a video that I released on November 9th, 2016 here in Japan, which was November 8th, 2016 in the United States, aka Selection Day, when people were busy voting for their puppet master of choice. And I wanted to make a video that wasn't about the selection of which puppet will rule over the planet or the American empire for four to eight years. Uh, I wanted to make a video that addressed the real heart of the issue that uh, that we're facing and what we can do about it. And this was the video that resulted. Only love can defeat the New World Order. So back in my previous incarnation as a school teacher here in Japan, lo those many years ago, I, uh, as one of my gigs, was teaching at a kindergarten uh, where one day there was the four and five-year-olds uh, were creating little flags because there was going to be a marathon race in the town. It was a big deal. So they were going to stand and cheer the racers on. So they had to color these flags. And it was, uh, I think, a free coloring activity. It was just basically a square piece of paper or a rectangular piece of paper. They could color any way they want. So they're coloring them like four and five-year-olds would, just making random scri scribbles and swirls of color. But one of the little girls, obviously naturally talented and careful, was carefully coloring a very beautiful little rainbow pattern, um, very carefully making little sections into different colors, and it looked very nice compared to the random scribbles of the other children. And I, I watched as they were all doing this activity, and then I saw as the girl next to the girl that was doing the nice rainbow pattern looked over and saw how beautiful that rainbow pattern looked, and then looked at her own drawing and saw it was just a random mess of scribbles and didn't look very good at all, even a four or five-year-old can see the difference. And I could see the gears turning in this little girl's head as she saw this and obviously was jealous and maybe somewhat ashamed of her own uh, scribbles and how it, the, it was obviously such a better drawing. You could see that she was getting frustrated and angry about this and then of course inevitably she takes one of her crayons and starts scribbling all over the beautiful flag that the other girl was drawing. Um, that moment stuck in my mind as a moment that describes something about human nature or at least the worst part of our human nature which is of course jealousy, greed, uh, our our wish not just to be as good as someone else, but our wish for their thing that they have created to be as as bad, as, as ugly, as messy as ours. Uh, it's not just that we want to be up at someone else's higher level, we want to drag them down to our level. Uh, and that, again, I think is an important thing to understand. It's an important moment because to me, that very amply describes the way that the powers that shouldn't be, the, the psychopathic, uh, disgusting criminals that have commandeered the highest levels of power in the world, not just governmental, but financial and corporate and economic in various ways, that is their mindset and mentality. It is not, of course, about creation. It is not about the creation of beautiful things. It is not about lifting people up to a higher level. It is not about aspiring to be at a higher level. It is about trying to bring everyone down. It is easier to destroy than it is to create. It is easier to be jealous and greedy and hate the other person than it is to create something beautiful of your own or to appreciate what you have or to appreciate someone else for the gifts that they have without being jealous and without hatred. So unfortunately, because this is a fundamental part of human psychology, it is all too easy to play on that and to get people hating each other by inciting that moment of scribbling on the flag, as it were. And I think that's where we're at. I think it's pretty safe to say that's where we're increasingly at as 
as I've talked about before, I posed the question the other day and I left it open. If we are being programmed to hate, then how does that look in the online outrage culture and what are the alternatives? How do we avoid that? So as I record this, it is Tuesday, November 8th, 2016 in the United States. It's currently Wednesday the 9th here in Japan and the results are still coming in. So I don't know which of the faces of uh, the oligarchy are going to be wearing the mask for the American empire over the next four to eight years. But I do know this, that whatever happens, there is going to be a divided public that hates the other half of the population. And there is going to be a lot of hatred. There's going to be a lot of people pushing those buttons of hatred. And there's going to be a lot of uh, ugly incidents that could occur, but don't have to occur. And that's really my message for you today. The new world order that the psychopathic elite want to create is predicated upon people hating each other, hating those around them, hating those that they disagree with, hating, just hating, with just hatred in your heart. Because hatred fundamentally puts you in a place where you are reacting to what other people are doing rather than acting. It's the little girl realizing that, oh, she's doing something great, I want to destroy it, rather than focusing on what you yourself are doing, what you can do to better them, what you can even do to appreciate what other people are doing rather than destroying it. These are some big topics and I know there's going to be a lot of people who don't want to hear it and who can't understand what I'm saying right now, but I think in the long run, whatever happens today, over the next year, over the next four to eight years, over the next 50 years, whatever happens, there will be something on the other end of these times that we're living through. However crazy they may seem right now, there will be a humanity on the other side. And the question is, what kind of humanity do we want on that other side? Do we want a humanity that functions on hatred and division and hating the other and wanting other people to be destroyed and their creations and works destroyed? Or do we want to lift each other up as a society? And that's up to us. That isn't up to whatever political puppets or financial elite or string puller pullers. You are not powerless people just at the whim and mercy of these big forces. You are an active person who is actively creating your life. And you can choose to create that from a position of love or you can choose to create that from a position of hate. I know which side I stand on. I stand on the side of love. I hope you'll join me. That's it for this heady edition of the Corbett Report. I'm James Corbett at CorbettReport.com. I hope you'll get join me again very soon. That's it. Only love can defeat the New World Order. Uh, it's a simple message in some ways, but if I had to condense and distill my message down to one simple message, that would be it. So I think that is a pretty important gem from the Corporate Report archives. So thank you again to NAMCC for recommending or nominating that particular gem. And as I said in my video announcing this hidden Corporate Report gem contest, I did say that I would choose a user uh, who submits their idea to win a mysterious as yet to be named prize. And since I just played your nomination, NAMCC, I will nominate you as one of the co-winners of this prize. But since that's not very dramatic and not random enough, people might feel cheated. So I have gone to the trouble of writing every single user, a uh, username, Corbett Report user, who did nominate a video for this, or a, a thing for this hidden Corbett Report gem. And I wrote it down on these little pieces of paper. I've scrunched into balls. For example, there's Jakester. Um, again, just to make sure that you know that this is all legit. I've, I'll open up another one for the benefit of those listening at home. This is uh, Deflamis, Deflamis. So again, every single user who did nominate a hidden corporate report gem, I've put your username in on a ball here and put it in a corporate report hat, a nice little straw Japanese hat that I have lying around here. And I will pick out one of these paper balls randomly and the co-winner of the mysterious prize is I is bloke I is bloke thank you very much I is bloke and thank you for your hidden corporate report gem nomination thank you to everyone who took part in the contest I really do appreciate it so 
I is bloke and NAMCC are going to be receiving a prize. The question, of course, what prize? Well, this is the 10th anniversary edition of the Corbett Report. 10 years of work, an incredible amount of work, thousands and thousands of hours of audio and video and hundreds of articles, uh, just an incredible amount of work. How can you possibly encapsulate all of that work? Well, like this. I have gone to the trouble of redesigning all of the data DVDs so that they have a nice spiffy new package. And I am now, for the first time, releasing 2012 through 2016. So for those of you who have no idea what this is, the data DVDs are DVDs, literally data DVDs, that you can put in your computer and they have Every single article, every podcast, every interview, every video of the Corbett Report in that particular year. So the first disc is 2007 slash 2008, because I started in June 2007. So 2007, 2008, every single thing that I did is on this data DVD that you can, again, you can pop it into your computer and you can download the, all, all the files to your computer. You can put them on your phone, whatever it is. They're here they're ready to go. Uh, of course, all of these, all these interviews, all these podcasts, all these videos are available for free download on my site anyway. But here they are in in uh, handy DVD form, so that you don't have to worry about internet connections or internet censorship or long download times or whatever. It's here. It's encapsulated in a single. In this case, it's one disc. 2007, 2008 is one disc. 2009 again is one disc. 2010 is in fact two discs. 2011, two discs. 2012 gets a bit crazy. 2012 is literally... Oh, they're falling out. There's so many of them. If you're... <laughs> All the cases are going to fall now, too. Uh, literally five discs of information. And these are not ordinary... Again, these are not ordinary DVDs that you play in your video DVD player. These are data DVDs with 8.5 gigabytes of information per disc. So five disks, that's, what, 40 plus gigabytes of information, data, video files, audio files, articles. I mean, it's incredible the amount of information that's on here. So NAMCC and I is Bloke, you are both going to receive a complete set of data DVDs. Everything from 2007 all the way up to and through 2016, which is obviously as far as they go at the moment. So... Literally every single thing that I've ever done for the website for that nine-year period is going to be on these DVDs, and I'm sending them to those two Corporate Report users. Thank you for your participation. For everyone else, I truly do hope that you will get these DVDs. If you do like the work and do want to support the work and want to have the work for yourself so that you can download and copy and spread out to other people, of course, I encourage you to make copies of this information. Copy the DVDs or five individual files that you like, whatever it is. Whatever your hidden corporate report gem is, as long as it's pre-2017, it is on one of these data DVDs somewhere. So the big, the big oil documentary or Century of Enslavement or 9-11 Trillions or 9-11 Conspiracy Theory or absolutely everything is on the appropriate year. So it's just a question of finding out which year it is. Now these, of course, are all available for purchase from the website. And here's how it works. The data DVDs, again, eight and a half gigabytes per disc. And most of these are multiple discs. So an incredible amount of information. These are available for $50 per set. So the 2012, for example, five discs, $50. Uh, the 2011, $50. The 2013, $50. And that includes shipping and handling absolutely anywhere in the world. So in order to purchase your copy, please go to corporatereport.com slash support slash shop. Uh, the link will be in the show notes if you need it. And you can go there and purchase your copy of the DVDs. Uh, so again, that's the data DVD set literally everything that I've done up on the website up until 2017 is on these DVDs collectively and each year's set is available for purchase and once again this this work really couldn't continue without your ongoing support both your DVD purchases and your subscriptions I really do need and do appreciate that support so once again thank you to all of you for making this past 10 years possible I have to pinch myself 
to remind myself this isn't some dream that I'm living, that I am literally doing this work that I am so passionate about for a living on a day-to-day basis. That is incredible. That is a blessing and an opportunity that not a lot of people have in this life. I'm very, very much aware of that. So I'm going to continue doing the work and Don't worry, I'm not going to talk about myself or my website or the work again for another 10 years. So we'll do this once every 10 years. You'll allow me that indulgence, I hope. And let's make uh, this next decade another decade of dominance, not about the Corbett Report, but about free humanity waking up and implementing the solutions that will ultimately defeat the New World Order. And again, it's all about love. At the end of the day, it is about love. So on that note... We're going to end this edition of the Corporate Report podcast here. Once again, I couldn't do it without all of you. Thank you very much for all the support you've given over the past 10 years. And now back to your regularly scheduled programming. Well, at any rate, now back to the Corporate Report's regular work. Thank you again for tuning in. Mm-hmm.